Hello, welcome to Convergences, a political theory show from Zero Books at the intersection of emancipation and critical imagination. I'm Will, and I'm joined by my good friend Adam from Asset Horizon. Today, we're talking to Professor Thomas Nail about his book, Marx in Motion, A New Materialist Marxism, which adds to the long line of works rereading Marx for its contemporary situation. In this case, we search for Marx adequate to an age of movement. Thomas Nail is a professor of philosophy at the University of Denver, working the philosophy of movement. His work ranges from accounts of the politics of movement in theory of the border, high philosophical ontology in being and motion, a three-volume study on Lucretius, and a recent theory of the earth, which pushes us towards ethics that deals with climate change, not only in terms of conservation, but in terms of expenditure. So this philosophy of movement does not merely take movement as its object of philosophical inquiry, but also appears to be a philosophy which belongs to movement. Where does that leave those philosophies that work in the radical tradition of Marx? And indeed, how might philosophical and political movements in Marx's tradition act in light of the primacy of movement? Marx in Motion, as I read it, provides an answer to some of, some of those questions, and hopefully we're going to answer some of them today. So welcome, Thomas. It's really nice to have you on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So I thought we might start by asking, what are the kind of the readings of Marx or the problems in the readings of Marx that you found in previous frameworks of Marxist interpretation, which kind of led you to write this book? Yeah, so um, I teach a class on Marx regularly here. And one of the first questions that I ask just as like an introductory first day question is, tell me what you know about Marx and Marxism. Just uh, some of the students there have never taken a class on Marx. They've never read any Marx. But it's always interesting to hear what their kind of cultural unconscious understanding of Marxism is. Some of the answers are quite funny. Some of the students would just say, I don't know what it is, but my parents tell me it's evil and wrong and I shouldn't be taking this class. Other students will say like Marxism, it's about like killing people and genocide, right? I just like all kinds of stuff. But you know, over the about 30 students, you start to hear some repeating themes about what people know unconsciously about Marxism. So I'll talk about three of them. I think they're kind of in three camps, although the first two camps are the ones that I hear from students the most when they just think of Marxism. They think of, number one, some kind of determinism. And it's really, even after reading a bunch of Marx, sometimes it's still hard to disabuse them of this idea. I mean, it's not like there's zero. I mean, occasionally Marx will talk about ironclad laws of such and such and capital. And so it's occasionally lends himself to that kind of thing. But I think especially in the dissertation, which we'll talk about, that's like, that's just, that's out of the question. I think there's really different stuff going on in the dissertation that change our reading of when Marx talks about laws of capital, what a law of capital actually means for Marx. In any case, determinism, they say, like, history is just completely deterministic. And that there's some kind of developmental progress of human history that leads toward capitalism and then the overcoming of capitalism with communism. And sometimes they'll say, I don't like this idea because everything's determined for us in advance. So we don't really have any historical agency. And of course, I think this is definitely a miss and often overreading of any kind of themes about laws of motion or whatever in Marx. But, you know, some of the problems with that are some of the predictions that were supposedly so deterministic didn't exactly come to pass. Communism didn't exactly rise and take over capitalism and capitalism is dead. That hasn't happened. That didn't happen the way that some Marxists thought that it would. And determinism is both uh, philosophically unsatisfying and kind of politically just was not true when we look at those things. The second one is reduction. And this kind of, it's related. Uh, two parts of the reduction. One is everything can be explained with economic laws. As long as we understand economic laws, we just really don't need any other social or critical analysis. Sexism, racism, homophobia, ableism, we don't need any special analysis. Those are all residues or byproducts of the capitalist mode of production, which, if analyzed properly, can explain how all of those things uh, emerge and are caused directly and exclusively by capitalism. So some students will say that one, that like, oh, the analysis of economics is at the center or something. But, you know, the, the, the stronger version of that is, um, I don't know, I've been in some Marx reading groups with some older Marxists who are very much committed to that idea. And I recently got a peer review, actually, from a Marxist who said, uh, who didn't like my article because he said it was race reduction. 
like that I was reducing things to racialization and racism, which was not the case. But even if I was doing but you see like the hostility towards that kind of reduction. So one is economic reduction. The second one is material reduction. What there is in the world, and this is Engels and Lenin, is just is matter. And what matter, and everything can be reduced to matter. And what matter is explained by the laws of classical mechanics. Newton with a little bit of thermodynamics in there, but it's all classical basically. And that's a kind of reduction. It's mechanistic. We can understand and predict the way that matter will move. And at the scaled up level of society, we're going to get, we're going to get some answers about how things are going to evolve and some serious universal causal relations. The third one that students usually don't say, unless I get maybe like an environmentalist student in there or something, but this is, and I'm not naming names in the history of philosophy, except for like Engels and the Soviets. We would get too far down the rabbit hole if we talked about all the people who held various versions of these. Uh, But the third one is anthropocentrism. And this is maybe, all, I mean, there's versions of this story. Some are humanist, some are structuralist or post-structuralist. But the basic idea is that when Marx was talking about labor and analyzing capital, capitalism is just a human construction. Humans make it up and they could make up something different. And when we analyze it, we need to look at how humans make it and the consequences for humans of this economic structure. That would be a more structuralist reading. The more humanist one would be that there's something like a human essence, which is universal, unchanging, applies to all humans through history, and that Marx believed in this kind of thing and felt that we necessarily had to achieve it or that it was something determinate that we could achieve or should strive to preserve. In any case, These are the kinds of anthropocentric readings of Marx. And one problem with the anthropocentric readings is, first of all, again, it's just not present in the dissertation. I find it not present really anywhere. Just because he talks about humans doesn't mean humans are the only or that they're the center. When you're talking about capitalism, you're going to end up talking about human structures, but that doesn't mean that's only humans that are involved in reproducing them and so on. But you know, in an age of, of climate change and ecological collapse, it's very important to think about the ways in which capitalism is very much works with the metabolic processes of nature and thinking only about humans and their scale and what they do. It's one piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only one. So anyway, those are some of the main assumptions and readings. And they're both unconscious and in the air and also a, a par- the product of a long history of Marxist analysis that I'm trying to get away from those three things and show that in Marx, you do not have determinism, you do not have reductionism, you do not have anthropocentrism, and instead, you have something really different um, that we can talk about. And I think movement is a central theme for Marx and the study of patterns of motion. And particularly thinking about sort of how to get out of these biases or simply to reconfigure Marxism so that you know, any additional analysis of ableism or racism isn't just a kind of a flavoring on the Marxist base. I mean, I think you have the work of someone like Cedric Robinson, who has done some amazing work on the theory of racial capitalism and the like. And uh, I think you, your work is tackling a similar kind of problem. How do we do a Marxism that doesn't simply apply itself or add on extra bits at the end, but a Marxism whose theory of materialism and dialectics encompasses the production of all of these parts of capitalism and all of the various kind of isms, ableism, racism, sexism, and and, and so so on. So why in particular should we turn to something like Marx's dissertation? Because it seems in the abstract itself, quite abstract, it's it's a debate between Epicurean and Democritian theories of matter. Do we have discrete atoms or do we have Epicurean uh, atoms that fall and decline and swerve and have this Klinemann motion? So what particularly drew you to the uh, dissertation? Yeah, I mean, honestly, my work on Lucretius drew me to the dissertation. Like Will was saying, I I, I wrote three volumes on Lucretius, and I'd been reading this book very carefully and thinking about some of the historical consequences of people who had read Lucretius and took him Mm. very seriously in what is one of the most rare and strange ideas in the history of Western philosophy, and that's the swerve. I spent a lot of time trying to track this down. Who will actually affirm this without some other qualification? I mean, everybody almost in the Western tradition has read Lucretius, but they're usually really unsatisfied with this idea of the swerve. So this was ancients that came after him. This is Plutarch and Cicero. They're like, there's some cool stuff going on, but this swerve business, this is, doesn't make any sense. Are you telling me matter just like spontaneously moves without any cause that's causing it to move? Mm. It just has a kind of 
agency of its own. This is nonsense. This can't possibly be the case. And then later modern interpreters are like, this swerve business, that's going to be human freedom. So human freedom gets to become, it becomes a strictly human Mm. feature to be able to swerve. Not that all matter swerves. And again, that's like a direct contradiction to say Mm. only humans swerve and have freedom because in Lucretius, all matter has that freedom. In any case, I was drawn to Marx's dissertation. I mean, it's not that I hadn't read Marx continually for over a long period of time, but I hadn't really spent much time with the dissertation. Like I knew it existed. I had read a little bit of it, but I didn't have any link or connection to it. I didn't have any angle Mm. or to think about it. And so it kind of, I never finished it. And there's also like four or five notebooks on Epicurus and Lucretius, one of which is just a straight translation. Marx is just translating De Rerum Natura, which is the poem written by the Mm. first century Roman poet Lucretius. In any case, this idea of the swerve, I find very interesting. I think it's one of the things that makes Marx's materialism Mm. so original. It's one of the things that makes Lucretius's materialism very original. And it's one of the hardest and most rare things for interpreters of both of those figures, Lucretius and Marx, to accept without some higher explanation, because they're just not satisfied that matter could just have agency and move on its own, and that everything would be an emergent feature of this kind of metastable swerving process. Yeah, they don't like that. And so they throw in God and freedom and the will and I mean, all kinds of stuff in order to explain why matter moves. But Lucretius is there's no explanation. And in Marx's dissertation, there's no higher explanation. Marx says pretty much exactly in the dissertation, he says it's just absolute imminent motion. And he identifies the swerve as being, I mean, he calls it, that's what the materialist dialectic is for him, is that matter swerves. And in its swerving, it tends to iterate and generate metastable patterns that are kind of quasi-stable, but they're processes that have slowed down or iterated in such a pattern that they look like they're very stable. And he never goes back on the swerve. He absolutely affirms that matter swerves, just like Lucretius said. Even though the title of the dissertation is about like Epicurus and Democritus, when you, and I don't think anybody has except me, but when you look at actually how many citations Marx gives of Lucretius throughout the dissertation and the notebooks, Mm. he cites Lucretius almost of the the total citations, like half is Epicurus and half is Lucretius. There's a lot of Lucretius in there, partly because Lucretius wrote this big, he wrote a poem, a whole poem that we have, Mm. thankfully, and Epicurus, all we have are these three little fragments of letters uh, that he wrote. And there's no swerve in any of that. So there's Mm. no swerve in Epicurus that we have seen in the primary readings of Epicurus. It's Mm. all the description of the swerve is 100% in Lucretius and Lucretius only. So all of this to say that in the dissertation, one of the reasons it's worth going back to it and why Mm. this is, I mean, it's one of the least read books by Marxists. A colleague of mine who's taught me so much about Marxism, he's been doing it for a very long time. I was like, oh, have you read the dissertation? He's like, oh no, I've never read that. I mean, he's like read (laughs) everything from Marx and he hadn't read the dissertation. And then I I convinced him that it was worth reading and then he, he read it and he was just, absolutely shocked and amazed and very excited. Mm. And it's been a great connection. But so the determinism, the reductionism, the swerve undermines Mm. all of that. If Mm. Marx genuinely believes that matter swerves, that just by definition, it cannot be a deterministic materialism. It also can't be reductionistic. What are you reducing it to if matter is just moving and swerving? There's not some kind of substance at the bottom of all the movement that you could Mm. pull out and say, oh, everything is reduces to this. Because if you said Marx still thinks everything's reducible to matter, yeah, but what the heck is matter? Matter is genuinely swerving, then its its essence is not yet determined. And it can't be determined, so it can't be reduced to that. It doesn't fit the definition of a reduction, because there's no thing or substance to reduce it to. So insofar as Marx's theory of the swerve, Marx's adaptation of the Cretan uh, theory of the swerve, of the Klinemann, of the declination, is a critique of what typically people think as mechanistic matter. We have these fixed atomic units, almost like bowling balls, as you you call them in the text of Screech, going back to Democritus, all there is atoms in the void and they don't swerve, they just fall in a straight line, so to speak. How does the critique of discretion change the way we typically think of matter? Because I think I'm skipping over one of the questions a little bit, but people typically think of matter in a more common sense way as stuff precisely that doesn't move. It's immovable, it's immutable, it's the hard stuff. It's almost like an unnameable hard stuff that is the real thing. Even when you have certain discussions about material conditions and the like, it's that hard, immutable thing which you cannot move, you can't change. It's the simple fact of things, and uh, we need to adapt to that rather than to go with the flow of it. And how does this Lucretian 
the adaptation of Marx sort of cut through? How does the swerve swerve around the fixity of these of these notions of matter? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. The historical answer is this is a big difference between classical and quantum physics. After quantum physics, that, that idea of like matter as being some kind of substance or discrete little particle. No, it's not particles. These are fields of energy called quantum fields. The fields vibrate and stabilize. And when we observe it as a particle, but it's not fundamentally a particle. So the classical model just, I think, really falls apart, both in terms mm. of ideas of mechanism and causality, but also in terms of whatever the substance of matter is it's a very strange kind of thing to mm. say matter is like is this process of energy that fluctuates and stabilizes occasionally into particles which are not fully localizable like mm. you just i mean that under that undermines quite a bit of but what engels and lenin both thought but it is does not undermine what Marx says in the dissertation about Lucretius mm. and the swerve so what Marx does the basic idea is that Marx takes the components of atomism mm. and he says actually they're not really separate components so atom void fall swerve and repulsion these are the features the core kind of ontological features of atomism and marx is like these are not separate people treat mm. them as separate and that's why you get such a discrete kind of description or interpretation of epicurus or democritus and even of lucretius even though lucretius never uses the word atom at all it's a projection of Epicurean interpretations onto Lucretius. In any case, these are the key terms from Epicurus. And Marx says, actually, they're not separate. They're completely aspects. They're dimensions. They're moments of the same process. Mm. And that takes a little bit to get your head around because that is, first of all, absolutely not what Epicurus says. Marx is making a very big leap there. <laughs> that is Marx's. That was what Marx wants materialism to be. Because mm. while he's writing the dissertation, he's reading Hegel's Philosophy of Nature. And he's reading um, and he's thinking about the critique of religion. And of course, he's reading all this stuff in Greek atomism. He's trying to develop uh, a kind of materialist dialectic. And the mm. way he does that is through atomism. And instead of seeing them as separate moments, he says they're all iterations or dimensions of the same process. So there are and he says this directly in the dissertation that in the movement of matter, he says the particle or the atom like disappears completely. There is no atom because it's always moving. The atom only exists in a freeze frame moment of your mind where you kind of imagine a static mm. thing called matter made of particles. But Marx is very clear that in movement, there is no stable static particle. That's just a name that we give, but it's you work through the stages of that dialectic and you realize there's no fixed, there's no discrete stages. Mm. They're all just dimensions. So in my mind, that is Marx's rejection of the ontological idea of atoms. I recognize that he talks about them quite a bit in the dissertation, but he, they're only as stages of a materialist dialectic. And th that's also true. I mean, reading Lucretius has really brought this to the fore of my awareness and interpretation of how original Marx's move is, because nobody mm. had read Epicurus like that. And a lot of classics people, they're not reading Marx's dissertation, okay? They're reading mm. other stuff. They're like, I'm not, I don't need to hear from Marx what he thought about Epicurus. I'm going to go read other people. And Marxists often don't want to they're not i'm not going to go read a bunch of philological greek studies about ancient atomism that's not what marxism is about and so it's this really kind of weird in between place would that really never got much of a, a big reception in the reception and interpretation mm. of marx's work but if it had if people had taken it seriously they would have seen that there's no reduction there's no determinism that marx's materialism is defined by the swerving unpredictability and indeterminacy of matter but again, in classical mechanics, that's just not even possible. So there's like a mm. historical bias uh, toward looking for mechanistic and discrete uh, causal explanations. It kind of takes a certain historical moment to then see the importance of what Lucretius and Marx were both doing with respect to discoveries and recent experiments in, in contemporary physics. Mm. I, mean, I was just going to ask this, this kind of question, which forgive me if it's partially answered by what you've just said but something that seems difficult for me to think about and to kind of represent myself is this separation between the idea of motion and let's say the movement of a say a particle right because there seems to, it seems to be that it seems to be that there are two possible views one mm. is that this we could make some kind of incredibly radical claim which i think really is your claim which is that motion is fundamental or rather that's your claim and it's Marx's claim. But it also seems to be that you refer to something like matter in motion. And I wonder 
are we thinking of motion as fundamental or are we thinking as matter or something material is fundamental? But we just need to re-understand what that material thing is, right? We need to understand that this matter is really always in motion. It's not the kind of thing that classical mechanics thought it was. And if it is that motion is fundamental, how is it that you think Marx might have theorized or perhaps also how do you think about motion without something that is moving, right? Some kind of stable identity which exists before the motion that, that it is. And I, I know I understand it was sort of previously answered, but that's something which I find difficult. To yeah, think. yeah, that's that. I mean, I think it's not just you that finds that difficult to think. That is, that is the weirdness of quantum physics. The physics terms for that are position and momentum. And you never have you you never get both completely at the same time, which is to say that like if the more you look try to determine the position of a particle, the more the momentum becomes dramatically indeterminate, and vice versa with determining momentum, they're mutually entangled such that you can't ever have a definite determinate position and momentum at the same time. And that discovery, that realization. That is what makes matter in motion at this stage in physics and history. That is what makes them absolutely inseparable because there's no such thing as momentum without some, you know, without energy. There's always energy and momentum. And that's what matter and motion is. So in my mind, I don't think we can pull the two apart. They're always together, but we have words to describe it. I mean, it depends what discipline and who you're talking to. Physicists will distinguish between energy and matter. I mean, it's the same stuff, right? I mean, E equals MC squared. We know that matter is just energy, but it's just some kind of configuration of energy. And then if you ever ask a physicist what energy is, that's where the conversation kind of breaks down because there's not energy is not made of some other thing. It's just the name we've given to some sort of way of measuring something. Mm. In any case, energy and momentum, matter and motion, at every scale, those things are completely intertwined. So in my mind, I don't distinguish, but I would never try to define one without the other uh, because the matter is always moving and it's mm. always in, like there's not matter that doesn't move. I mean, let me know if anybody knows of any, but like just that's where we're at historically. Uh, if I'm, if we discover some matter that doesn't move, then my philosophy is out the window. I'm prepared for that moment, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. So there's no matter without movement and there's no movement without matter. That doesn't make any sense either. There's a version of this in, in Lenin's book on empirical materialism. And he describes a little bit of this, but it's not like he doesn't, he had, doesn't yet have the quantum physics to back up what he's doing. So he ends up kind of making mm -hmm. these kind of errors that are based on a, a bias of classical mechanics. I'd like to ask a question as well, actually, about this materialist dialectic, how it works in terms of the process of matter in movement looping back on itself. Because I mean, I really love this account, partially because I think it really maps well onto um, the Hegelian logic of determinacy in terms of lines looping back on each other. And I have a question about how the relation between atoms and the void, because it's it seems as if there's a, it seems like the void, it's, it corresponds to a bit of Hegel's own remarks uh, from the science of logic on Democritus and that the failure of Democritus is that the cry of everyone else in realizing that the void is a, itself a source of movement. And you do mention the void as a creative principle in which the matter and the internal voidness of it, the eternal avoidance of itself is not totally detached. I mean, not to be too idealist, but it seems like matter is not own, it's not really substance, but it's also subject to its own motions. It's, it's oh, a yeah. little bit, it's a little bit like, just to go fully, fully Hegelian on this uh, on this matter. It's very much a dynamical kind of materialism. So I was wondering how this knotting functions and how it works in Marx, particularly, because um, in a very sort of uh, classical dialectical way, it's a logic of interdependency, and you draw along, you draw on a, how Marx uses the word uh, Zusammenhänge. So the, you know, the hanging together, which you, you've changed the translation uh, from very sort of loose idea of connection to this idea of interconnectedness or interactivity. I was wondering if you could expand on that a, a little bit. Okay, so yeah, there's yeah, there's two things definitely related. The Zusammen hanging. I just think this is one of the coolest words that Marx gets a lot of mileage out of that is under underrepresented in the literature. Like I I have not read anybody like looking closely at this word and thinking mm. about what its ontological implications are. But I mean, it's a really cool, I mean, it's a very cool idea. And sometimes in the dissertation, it's completely removed. They just cut it out entirely of the English translation in, and, and remove that. And sometimes it gets translated, like you said, as connection. But then it assumes like, oh, there's like something over here and something over here. And like, they're interconnected. But Zuzam and Hangin are hanging together. Mm. That's, not what, that's not what it is. It, hanging together is like a spider's web. Everything 
is supporting everything else. And this is consistent in my mind with quantum. And that's a basic idea that all of the energy, not just some, but all of the energy in the universe is correlated. Things move at a distance together at the same time. And there's no direct causal connection. It's not a billiard ball. This one didn't cause this one to move, yet their movements are entirely correlated when you look at the spins. So like, okay, so this is well established both theoretically and experimentally in quantum physics. Mm. But to me, that idea of entanglement is not just at the physical level and ontological for Marx, it's also at the social. In And I think it, it cashes out in terms of like the idea of metabolism mm. later on in the capital volumes. And he'll think thinking about how everything hangs together. One other term he uses for that is metabolism and metabolic processes. They're sort of these feedback loops. He's taking this basic idea of matter as having this hanging together, iterative, entangled structure at the material level in his philosophy mm. of nature in the dissertation. And then by capital, one of the outcomes is theories of metabolism that are happening at the biological, natural, and sort of social levels all mm. together. Everything is doing that same thing at a larger scale. Your first question about the dialectic and the vo specifically the void. Yeah, that's another thing. It's like when people read Epicurus, you know, or Democritus, they, they treat and, you know, maybe it's fair in those people to talk about it this way. But Marx doesn't want to to think about the void is just absolute emptiness. Like just that's a total abstraction. Like, what are you talking about? Absolute negative void where there's nothing active at all. This is a very big historical difference between Hesiod and Homer and the whole poetic tradition, like hundreds and hundreds of years of Greek poetry and history leading up to this total abstraction that treats the void. Nowhere in the earlier Greek tradition do you see anything like a totally empty abstract void. It's the product of rationalistic abstraction of which I see Epicurus as basically mm. kind of following in that Democritian tradition of treating it as absolute nothingness. But if you look back at Hesiod, chaos is positive. Chaos is creative. I mean, mm. the world is born out of chaos. That doesn't suggest that chaos was nothing. It suggests that chaos is actually very positive. It's a positive chaos that's creative. And that has resonances with lots of mythological and religious traditions where chaos is active and the abstract version in Democritus, Hegel's right, that is a problem. That is a problem that needs to be mm. dialectically worked out of his philosophy because you can't just assume matter and nothingness. These are some of the most challenging passages in the dissertation that I have students mm. read and it takes us like two hours to go through like three lines of it. But it's where he's like walking through each of the stages and showing you how the atom, right, that stage, the atom, actually emerges positively out of the void. He, I mean, he, mm. you know, he uses the Hegelian language of like the negation. He says like, oh, the atom is the negation of the void. And so, but there, these are all just stages of a continual process. They're not absolute mm. ideal abstractions. They're actually material emergences. But I mean, this sounds absolutely crazy in a kind of specific Euro rationalist tradition in which you can't possibly imagine something coming out of nothing. But that's mm. because that nothing, if you, ab if you take everything away from it, then that's, you get two abstractions, which make no sense. In any case, this, uh, there's a contemporary a correlate here, which is, this is in quantum physics, what they call a quantum mm. vacuum. And the quantum vacuum, it's like when you like really look very closely at what energy is doing, there's never a point where you get to the bottom and you're like, oh, here it's not doing anything. It's taking a break. There's no break. There's no rest. It never stops. So the, va the quantum vacuum is positive. It's, it's always, vi it's constantly vibrating and it never stops. But we, but it's, it gets to very low energies, but it never stops changing and moving. So it always has momentum and always from that vacuum, it's possible for things to emerge out of that vacuum. I mean, one way to think about reality as it is now, it's nothing but that vacuum just rolled up and excited and stabilized into various states of matter over a cosmic history. But that vacuum is not empty. There is no empty vacuum. The Big Bang didn't happen out of nothingness. It came from indeterminately high energies that we just, we can't, okay, I'm going to stop on the quantum physics stuff. But my point is, Marx wasn't totally out of line to suggest this reading. Although he, at the time, I think he was doing it from kind of Lucretian and Hegelian dialectical inspirations. Mm -hmm. the, the, the physical correlate is now absolutely, that is experimentally true. It's, it's not, there is no totally perfect empty void. Nothing is nothing, not even itself. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Right, I've been refining that line in the chapter for about two years now. I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, so perhaps to try and, because of course, very quickly, Marx's materialism becomes a kind of materialism which takes as its primary object, 
the social, right? If we can use kind of words, <laughs> the social, but something like that, right? And I'm interested. So, where do you see? How do you see us um, using this kind of analysis of motion? to analyze what appear to be kind of structurally sedimented systems. So say that we look at the present existing structure of capitalism, which at times feels pretty permanent, right? Or it can feel kind of like it really, it's kind of there. It, should we take those objects as stable and in motion? Or is, this, is the stability a mere illusion? Or is it something kind of stronger than us just getting, getting the facts wrong? Um, because this seems to be a, a kind of a, a distinction between some f- versions of Marxism, which will say the way the world appears is just false, right? And you just need to get, you just need to get the science right, and that's kind of one impulse. And then another impulse is to say, well, actually, there's a sense in which the world really is structurally sedimented, but of course we need to work to undo that, both in philosophy and praxis. So I'm interested in how you see this kind of really base level materialism informing kind of questions about the analysis of the kind of a structurally sedimented capitalism. I've used that term too many times now, but that's kind of the question. So where's, how is this applied kind of to social objects uh, and economic objects, political objects? Yeah, so this is how I read the dissertation and then continue that sort of framing, which is to say movement, metastable patterns, swerves that kind of end up producing something fairly stable. And I think this is actually the same thing that Marx, again, I haven't really seen this highlighted in Capital, but it's absolutely there. Marx calls it the analysis of the Bewegungsform. So the Bewegungsform is the forms of motion, the patterns of motion. And he says in, in the preface, or one of the prefaces, this is what this what's capital, what's what capital is all about. It's the analysis of forms of motion. Now, I think you're right that some some people think about this as like, oh, there's like a true thing happening underneath, and we have all this ideological stuff. So like religion is actually like it's totally false, and you just need to realize that it's stupid make-believe, or capitalism is just a lie, and you just need to realize that it is a lie. But like that's not Marx's line. I mean, that's not what Marx thinks. Like, why would you need to write capital if that if you actually believe that? You could just say you would only you would need only part of chapter one to get to that point where you're like, yeah, the whole idea of value is a metaphysical abstraction. Done. Stop believing in it and capital will go away. But it doesn't work like that. I mean, you can't just stop believing in capital. It doesn't go away if you stop. Like just because we know capitalism is wrong and metaphysical nonsense and destroying the planet, just thinking that doesn't do anything. It doesn't change capital. So the question for Marx is like, let's understand how this particular story, which is to say, the, not just the belief, not, not just the kind of Feuerbachian subjective belief in religion or in capitalism, but the performance, what we do, how we make. And it doesn't just mean capitalists. It means all of us. Like, how does the world itself, all of it, not just humans even, how is all of that shaped into metastable patterns that produce a reality that when you look at that reality, it looks like it's totally natural and inevitable. And that's how capital opens is you look around, we start with the commodity in our hand and we look around and see a world full of commodities. And that's where we start. It looks like it's totally natural, but you know, I mean, natural in the sense of inevitable and like we didn't make it and it makes us and all that. But you know, the point of capital is to show that we make that. And what are all the techniques and mechanisms that make it like as if it were true. And of course, there's the true believers and then people who don't give a shit. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in capitalism or whether you don't care about it, you don't believe in it. You, To the degree to which you reproduce the same patterns of motion, the Bewegungsform, that's the degree to which it exerts a real genuine power. It's the same with religion. Marx didn't, it's not like he believes in religion, but he's like, look, religion is real. When people make architectures and infrastructures and, in, and institutions and they teach it and there's books and there's an entire governmental structure, like if when everything we build around it as if God were real, as if some particular God were real and had real effects in the world, to the degree to which we perform it. And so this is why there's all that language in chapter one, all about like the masks and the persona and the stage and the performance. Marx is drawing on Shakespeare and this kind of performative tradition to say, look, society is performative. It's not a question of ideology, whether you think it's true or not. It's a question of how it's performed. And that's what he's looking at is like, how is it performed? How do we put on these masks and play this game over and over again? Um, And so it's not just a question of like ideology critique of like, oh, now you got the right answer. Well, you're on your way now. I mean, 
what what to do what i mean just because you might just have to perform the same stuff so that's just to say i think that's the, without getting into the technical details of the emergence of value that is basically how capitalism works in marx's analysis is it's a pattern of motion that we reproduce collectively and insofar as we keep doing that we keep making it we keep making it real whether we like it or hate it or believe in it or not we just keep, as long as we keep making, it keeps existing as if it were real and it doesn't need us to believe in it. It just needs us to reproduce the pattern of motion. So ideological analysis just really hits a wall there. You need a practical kind of material and kinetic analysis to be like, these are the patterns we're doing. Let's stop doing those. Like mm. not just think that they're wrong, but actually stop doing them and doing different ones and then experiment with different kinds of patterns we could do. So thinking about the notion of pattern, and I wanted to move into the, uh, the, the stuff on, on value as well, it does seem like the critique of capitalist metabolisms or metastatic forms of, mo of capitalist motion would move from a critique of, you know, yeah, as you said, ideology, propositional belief, more to a kind of critique of habit, and habit in the broadest sense of you know, social habits, as you said, patterns, and also how we internalize the social, I mean... Um, the Lars Matari are famously very good on this notion of social habit with, with things like the earth start, you know, the, the I think is a, or the Kantian model of understanding the mind is divided between faculties that legislate over each other. Model the mind after a state as a habit they want us to counter with a, a nomadological look at things. But just before we get into the idea of value in terms of its habitual nature, I just wanted to ask a question about um, the fundamental process of devalorization that comes with the production of value as such, because the most sort of provocative claim of this book is that Marx never had a labor theory of value. The theory of value is based on appropriation and just, if I wanted to read this um, really good quote that summarizes quite part of your thesis on value, which is that, so labor is based not on, sorry, value is not based on labor, but on appropriation and uh, originary accumulation or primitive accumulations. I mean, as you say, Thomas, the, the movement of use values back and forth is tied neither strictly to their qualities, nor to the accidental subjective preferences for their qualities or quantities, but rather to a foundational theft. The measurement of this theft as abstract labor time is neither merely subjective in the appropriated qualities or quantities, which have no value, nor purely subjective in the, des in the desires of humans, but related to a number of concrete historical conditions of what can be appropriated and how easily. So could you break this down for us in terms of how a kinetic reading of Marxism shifts the conversation on value to one that not only incorporates the fundamental act of appropriation at the heart of all capitalism, and this of course is really, I think it's great because it expands into the fundamental things of how those materials got to the factories in England, which of course uh, has to give the entire primitive accumulation fact of racial capitalism brings it into the very mechanism of motion itself. Absolutely, yeah. So the labor theory of value is roughly, in my understanding, is that value, the quantity, the number, how value is determined is related mm. to some proportion, or it's related in some ways to the labor activity. And that we could somehow, if we worked hard enough, and you can find lots of Marxists trying to do all the mathematics and the logic and with all the symbols of like, how is it that a certain quantity of labor is it changes the value uh, and what's the relationship between mm. those things my reading of marx and i'm not alone in this reading is that marx doesn't believe in value like he's not off capital is not an alternative story of like what a better way to assess value would be like that's just not what he's up <laughs> to it's a critique of political economy it is a rejection of the whole bogus metaphysical idea of value it is he is not in favor of value value is he's analyzing it only to show you how capitalists, mm. and it's an imminent critique within the structure of capitalism, value gets determined in these ways. He doesn't mean that's true, or he's got a better analysis of value. Like mm. So this, to me, off the bat, there's not like, oh, if we properly valued water and clean air, we would somehow get like a, a greener capitalism, or we would get some Marxism mm. that properly analyzed and quantified the thermodynamic energies used by animals or plants in the air. And I mean, it's ridiculous. Like that was never Marx's project. So there is no labor of theory of value because ultimately and philosophically, there is no necessary connection or proportion between labor and value. Mm. So just to go and like just use value, the specific term is just the qualitative acts of existing that to, in 
we'd have to get into the details of the lines here, but I w- but in my reading, and I think this is consistent with the manuscripts and capital, use value includes not just what humans do. Use value includes mm-hmm. what the earth is doing. And Marx is very clear throughout that the earth is the kind of, it's the origins of all that value. But I mean, just like it, it becomes absurd when you start thinking of like, what is the value of the planet earth? Like, well, there can't be a value of the planet earth. What does that even mean? Or like <laughs> the value of stars. I mean, it's not that kind of thing. There's just no necessary value to those things. And yet they're the basis of value. If there was no planet, there'd be no value. So anyway, the point is that value, what value does is it quantifies and treats as a quantity without Mm. qualitative dimension. Some process could be animals or plants or air or water or women's labor or slave labor, all kinds of things that are not Mm. counted. So what, as as you said, in the Atlantic slave trade, who gets paid a wage is like, are they like, what is it that goes into making a textile in the 19th century? Tons of stuff, right? Clean air, clean water, non-war conditions, the Atlantic slave trade, like all of the network of slavery and transport and ships and maps and compasses and all the inventions that made that possible. Certain ideas and practices and histories of racism in the West. Anyway, this huge apparatus is like goes into making it possible Mm. for some raw materials to show up in the British workers' hands at a certain time for them to get paid a wage. And then capital says, you know what the value of this is? It's this, or like the socially necessary part of this is, it is, and then they count only a tiny portion of everything that went into that. Mm. Because if they actually counted everything that went into that, first of all, it'd be ridiculous to do that. But second of all, more importantly, it would be totally unprofitable instantly. So Silvia Federici had in the 70s a campaign against mm. or uh, to identify women's labor. Like we, there should be wages for housework. And some critics were like, well, I mean, if we actually paid women for the wages that they do in housework, like that's something like 60 percent of GDP, like no capitalist wouldn't make any money. And she's like, exactly. <laughs> this is like it's not a demand that can be fulfilled without destroying capitalism. But you expose that instantly when you're like, what actually is the value of clean water or air or women's labor or the value of migration, which we only count some tiny fraction mm. of the entire life of a migrant who has traveled and lived mm. in other places and had to move? How do you there's just no that's just not part of the calculus. And so my point is that the calculus itself is totally arbitrary, founded on it's a violent move to strip some situation down to its pure quantities and ignore all of its qualities mm. and what's called abstract labor time. That there's no such thing as abstract labor time. That's not a real thing. Nowhere in the world will we ever find abstract labor time. It is itself an abstraction and that is what value is. It's an abstraction. Uh, Guattari, speaking of them, has this great line in Anti-Oedipus. Like, he says that he calls it like a cosmic swindle. But to like mm. give a value to something is just ridiculous. Like To quantify it in some ways, there's no way that's not totally arbitrary. And that's Marx's point. Value is a completely arbitrary term. And to the second part of your question about primitive accumulation and violence, it just shows you that the whole mm. process, it's just force. A capitalist will determine the value of something by whatever mystical calculus they'll come up with, and they'll call it something rationalistic post hoc rationalize it and say like, oh, it's this was what was socially necessary. And then they'll count like 1% of all the stuff that actually was really necessary (laughs) to make that thing. And then they'll just call that socially necessary. And then they might fudge that depending on how much Mm. profit they want to make. It's a flexible euphemistic term that we shouldn't take very seriously as a real thing. We should take it for what it is as a totally violent appropriation. It means that women's labor is just totally unpaid because it's not it's not just an omission. It's an active theft. It is a stealing of women's labor. It is a stealing of colonial labor. It's a stealing of natural. I mean, like I say stealing, but it's like it's predicated on all those things, patriarchy, colonialism, violence against nature, all of those things. It's predicated on that, but it covers Mm. it over and says we've got a perfectly rationalistic explanation for assigning value. But Mm. the only way they can do it is by force. Because nobody would have given up their lives and land for that nonsense. Nobody wants to move to the city and be a proletariat and work 12 hours a day, but be paid almost nothing. Like if you have subsistence agriculture, very few people are ever willing to give that up voluntarily. It's all predicated on theft and colonialism. The calculation problem is no longer a problem other than how to calculate reparations, essentially, under this reading, because it's the calculation problem essentially goes, the mystique of it goes away, this this long-held problem in Marxism. But just to go a bit further into the notion of value as a kind of a, I'm going to say a phantasm or a spook, because I, I think Stern mm. still has a bit more influence on Marx than people would like to admit. But the way that this, this spook, this phantasm of value functions, uh, you describe it in a manner of an as if. And this all goes back to the 
critique of matter you get in dissertation, which is the problem is that is that the productive movement of capitalism separates workers from being, separates animals from, you know, from their own being in terms of turning them to meat factories and so on and so on, separates the workers who produce from their products. And this separation, this movement of taking away, which is, of course, appropriation, also creates the semblance that it is a distinct thing. There is a distinct essential fixed identity to the alienated product, the commodity. The essence of the commodity is to be so discreet. And I want to ask how this as-if functions, how this production of ideology functions, and how this becomes, I guess, habitual. How the how the very products of this creative nothing that is the material person then hangs over them as a kind of a, a Stenarian spook later down the line, and also becomes habitual. So even if you don't believe in it, you're still habitually acting as if it is really this spectral thing hanging over you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I feel like you almost partially answered that. But can you phrase the part of the question again that you had in mind? Like, how does that work exactly? Like, yeah. how does the spook become really performed or something? Yeah. How does so how does this as if structure enter into the specific kinds of movements that capitalism is? And how does it you think it becomes habitual in such a way that we don't only produce capitalism from our own labor, but also reproduce it? I mean, how could how could right. kinesis become a critique of ideology that goes deeper? Than, than the semblance of ideology in the sense of you know, affirmative yeah. belief in the actual, because we don't have to believe in the system to, to do it. As Mark says, they, they know what they, it's like they know what they are doing, but they, that they still do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, one answer to this, I mean, there's probably a lot of ways we could look at how this gets performed and why mm. people keep performing it. But I'd say that one of the reasons and origins is, again, in primitive accumulation, which is to just say the long list of things that Marx describes, land appropriation, slavery, mm. colonialism, like when there's no other option. What, why would you perform such a metaphysical nonsense of like value and labor and wages? Why would we do all that stuff? I mean, one of the short answers to that is just threat of violence. Like you will mm. die when this is that, that capitalism has its origins. It would have never got off the ground. And this is, again, part of the story of racial mm. capitalism. Like there's just no separating race, racism and capitalism. It only got off the ground to begin with because it stole disproportionately mm. from colonial populations. It stole. And I mean, even in the case of England and Ireland, every case we can see, capital always starts. And like that's why the book ends with the chapter on colonialism and mm. primitive accumulation. It's as if the, the the historical beginning happens at the end of capital. And then you see that, oh, how does all this stuff get off the ground such that why would we reproduce this? Well, under pain of death. Mm. Well, you've got nothing else. If you've lost subsistence agriculture and access to the land, if indigenous commons have been stolen and taken away and the land appropriated by violence and theft, there just is no other, there's no other, it's not easy to then resist it. Even if you hate mm. it, even if you don't believe in it and think it's ridiculous, there's the other, the penalty is death. So, I mean, this is one of the, I mean, it's, there's a million consequences of slave revolts, but, you mm. know, indigenous genocides. It's like people who can't work and who will not face a system have to be murdered. And like, that's, I mean, like you really, it's quite dramatic. It's like, go to the cities or we'll kill you. And even in Marx's chapter on primitive mm. accumulation, the case of England, he talks about this woman who just refuses to like a peasant woman whose lands and commons are being appropriated uh, and privatized, just refuses to leave. And so they just burn her house down with her. I mean, that mm. kind of thing. It's like people, you refuse to leave and you refuse to work, you will die. But I mean, this yeah. is completely like, that is the true face behind the mask of humanistic, rationalistic, neoliberal economics. Oh, it's all just rational, free choice and actors acting in their own mm. interests. Like after everything's been stolen from them, like after you've set up a world such that their own interest can either be to die or reproduce capital. Yeah, I guess my self-interest is to reproduce capital, but like, that's not really my self-interest. That's just mm. the one you've already pre-selected for me. So then I do it and feel free because I'm participating mm. in it, but it's only predicated on a really long history and an ongoing activity activity of colonialism, theft, and violence. So that's the Absolutely. short answer of why we do the dance and wear the masks. And there's an entire unequal distribution of all mm. that mask wearing and persona and who gets to do what jobs and get paid what money. But all of that's only happening because 
at some point, and continually so, capitalists continue to steal land, dispossess people, force them into migration, and give them and take away private property such that there's really nothing left almost for us to do. If you or I just decided to stop working and just stop working, like we might die. Like, I mean, legitimately, like we might be, we're not going to have a house. We're not going to have a place to stay. We're not going to have food. I mean, we might, yeah, we very well might die or lots of really horrible things mm. might happen to us if we just refused to work. So I just, I try to often remind students, I'm like, although this feels like the discourse of economics is very rational and calculated, it's all predicated on this basic threat of violence, work mm. or die. And you don't really have another choice. Yeah. Now, I, I just wanted to ask a question about about the relation uh, between this kind of rethinking of Marx's theory of value and the kind of pot potential political consequences it might have. And, and one of those is that one of Marx's more famous theses, right, is the, something like the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, right, as since labour is the, you know, and the standard recounting of it goes, if, I, if someone will, you know, get very angry at me if I get a, a, a line of this wrong. But the basic version of it goes something like, labour is the generator of all value. Over time, the process of capital, capital, the capitalist accumulation results in the ever greater replacement of labour by capital. And as such, the rate of profit will continue to fall as capital becomes replaced by labour, right? And thus capitalism produces you know, its own negation, right, which is going to be communism. And I'm interested in where the status of things like that, right, and I know that you're trying to take it away from determinism, this reading of Marx um, and Marx away from determinism, but I'm interested in this, if Marx does hold this kind of non-deterministic ontology where motion is primary, what's the status of claims like that? And are those, are they just inconsistent and we just need to, you know, get rid of them? Or is there kind of a rereading of those kinds of claims in light of this kind of rereading of the first kind of part? Of yeah, so there's sort of two parts to the answer or two ways to answer it, at least. Uh, one of those ways is there's a really big literature looking at precisely that question of whether Marx was right about the tendency of profit to fall. Um, so I am not recently versed in all of this literature, but know enough to give at least one example, although we might have others. One of those is financialization. So financialization was one way to deal with this particular problem of like, you got labor and God, we just hyper exploited everybody to the bone. And we have a certain crisis around the 70s of like consumption. If people are too exploited and impoverished and oh, who's going to buy all of our stuff? So, I mean, war is one way to, to, to fill that consumerism or the debt structure and financial so that people who can, they can invest in investments and hedge funds. So you can avoid this, just skip these laborers and like real wages and like real things that people are actually making. And you could just make money off the stock market itself. And then around this time, you can see how real wages continue to like deflate and then a really big spike in financial profits. So I mean, is profit actually falling there? I mean, so I think that, so that's just to say there are really good historical examples that we might think of in which that law is not strictly true and things that Marx maybe didn't uh, fully anticipate like financialization. I mean, he does in volume three have some stuff on finance, but again, I haven't read that stuff recently. So anyway, that's one way to answer it. The second way to answer this is I think kind of just the more imminent critique answer Marx is taking a look at this kind of as if structure, as if value were real. I mean, that is the core of all of capital, not the book, but also of capitalism itself. It's the linchpin. You pull that out and nothing else really works. Nothing else makes any sense. You have to have value. And for Marx, like if you accept value, it's a very simple, basic metaphysical premise. But if you accept it, lots of other things follow from this under capital. And then that's what capital is. It shows all these different kinds of mechanisms and internal structures. But again, I just like the way, I mean, I know it's, and I certainly had moments where I read capital like this as well, which is to look at it as like, he's describing like how capital actually works. And I think what he's describing is actually the internal logic of capital as an imminent system, not whether this will definitely historically happen. I mean, it happens to, as long as we accept the assumption, value, and the, me and the mechanisms of profit generation and surplus value, as long as we accept that, we are going to play out all of these imminent laws. Now, there can be exceptions historically to these things, Un unanticipated things that Marx may or may not have anticipated or thought of might happen that might undermine that because capital is not a completely 
enclosed system that's immune from the contingencies of history and nature and struggles and the swerve of materiality and ecological collapse and climate change. Like these aren't things Marx was certainly aware and thinking about ecological uh, damage, but something like climate change that is a bit more specific than he had in mind and maybe a bit more apocalyptic even than he had in mind. In any case, that's to say that if you accept the laws, for example, of the labor theory of value, uh, or some version in which labor is the foundation, and then it generates this value, and then there's laws that make sure that value is reproduced and has a specific relation to that labor, the imminent laws will carry out and have a tendency to re reproduce some patterns. Anyway, that's the way that I would read that as like an imminent law that Marx is laying out and not like a promise that this will definitely happen in history. Because for Marx, like history, history is open. It's open to the contingencies. It's not fully deterministic. So I think the, the question you're asking is kind of showing us there's this tension of how to read capital between a deterministic reading of like, Marx said this would happen. Is it happening? And if we say no, then Marx was wrong about something. It's like, look, he could be right about the imminent laws of capital. But he might be wrong about some unpredictable historical event that changed or shifted the way those laws were expressed or even whether the laws were expressed at all. So anyway, I mean, I don't think it means we need to throw out Marx or something. I just think they're general tools uh, in the toolbox of understanding capital, and they might not always work, and they might not be always the tools that are the most important to look at any given moment. Yeah, and I'm a no, I mean, I, it, for me, it's the, the kind of the, the core of it is try, I was trying to reread that kind of uh, chapter on capitalist accumulation, like the general law of capitalist accumulation, and trying to see how that would kind of work without labor. And but obviously one of the key things which you know Marx doesn't talk about a huge amount in Capital Volume One because what this was the first volume in a ten volume series which would be followed by three more ten volume series one of which was going to kind of be about the state and I'm I'm sort of interested in the kind of the political import of of kind of this theory of kinetic Marxism and the chapter at the end of the end of your book I thought found really fascinating on kind of kinetic communism. And I'm interested in how you think that this concept of kinesis transforms kind of perhaps other associated Marxist concepts like Marx's concept of freedom, the concept of equality, the concept of revolution and things like that. And to an extent, that's a kind of an academic question, but then the real dimension of it is how does this, and I, you know, forgive me for the pun, how does a, a Marxism based on movement transform movements based on Marxism? And it's it, because... It feels like it, it must do, but I'm kind of interested in how you might see that. And of course, because it's Capital Volume One doesn't talk a great deal about that. It's kind of it, it kind of is yet to be answered. So I'm just really interested to hear what you, what you yeah. say. Yeah, well, that. I mean, Marx doesn't talk that much about communism anywhere. So that actually in chapter one is one place where there is more than one page and a, and a footnote, a lengthy footnote about communism. I mean, it's one of the few places where he actually says some things about free association and that the like how subsistence and free free activity would be allocated and people would share those so that they could maximize like free time to do other things as Marx says in oh is it the manuscripts or Kaplan forgetting but to like he gives a long list of things that people might do and he says like reading books and fishing and and he says fencing and dancing and all of these things that one might go about that's kind of I mean that's what it's that's what it's about I take it to be it's not just like, how do we fulfill basic needs? It's like, look, the purpose of fulfilling basic subsistence needs is actually so that you can kind of maximize the time to experiment in all kinds of aesthetic and creative ways, not just to have food and have a house. Uh, mm. Although that is a baseline, that's not the goal. That's not the end goal. Um, so it's an open, it's an open question. So I'd say he doesn't say a lot about what communism is, but the things that he does say about uh, communism as it relates to the kinetic patterns or what I'm calling a like kinetic communism, there's two aspects. One is just kind of like a metaphysical house cleaning, like just know what is a metaphysical kind of belief that's not really founded in anything that really exists like value that's at the very heart of capitalism. But let's just get rid of that nonsense and not fall for that. I mean, even if we're forced to reproduce it, at least know what you're doing and know that it's possible to do something else that's not that. So in other words, there's no necessity of capitalism historically. There's no necessity that we have to reproduce it. It's not a, It's not the best way for humans to organize. It's not the only way. This is just counter to the classical political economy story of like, yeah, it's just totally natural and humans have been heading this way, learning more and more until finally like we hit the jackpot 
and discovered capitalism. And now it's been coming all along because it was a totally natural mode for humans to want to exchange their labor for money, even though it started off with like bartering and trading, it built up and people learned these lessons that culminate in capitalism. So anyway, just the house cleaning there of like, let's not buy any of this, the necessity of this project or any of its metaphysical trappings. Let's think about it as a pattern of motion that we are repeating. And if we want to repeat something different, then we actually have to change that pattern of motion. And in terms of the ter- the ideas that you said, so like freedom, uh, equality, or justice, or things like that, I-, I mean, I think those have a place in the political process, but they have a practical place. At least in my view, I think it's safer to treat them as a- in practical ways of like, what does freedom mean here for these people now as they determine it? Not me, philosopher, thinking about the nature of freedom, a historically, whatever, like that. I, I don't want to go down that road. And I think it's possibly dangerous to be postulating too big about really big because I mean they're kind of metaphysical traps to get in defining justice like oh come on I'm not going to define justice like that's just one of those things that's a, it's, a, it's it has a working practical definition and it can change and it really ought to change depending on who's involved in doing it so that we don't in advance exclude all kinds of possibilities and things that people might want to do and call justice it's not really for me or any of us to say definitively, here's what it is <laughs> forever and all time or something like that. And I certainly don't think that's, I don't think it's what Marx has in mind quite either. So this, just to get back to now, that's the first part is just like clean away all of the rubbish that is ob- obfuscating and mystic- uh, mysticizing or like mystifying what's really going on. Because what's really going on are these bebegung forms and how people uh, are repeating these social patterns. That's what's going on. And we can see that. Again, it's not like here is the real because the real is a metastable thing that's changing all the time versus the fake. See, So step one is just see what's going on more or less practically without any of the ideological bag- baggage. And step two is once you see more or less the patterns and you kind of map them out, here's what's moving here. Here's how these people, people are moving there. How do you want to move now? And that question has to be posed, I think, to the widest, most inclusive range of people and animals and plants and things like how do things want to move and that has to be experimental it's got to be negotiated this is in other words an expansion of so what marx calls the the metabolisms like these three metabolisms of like the human body the natural world and the social metabolism these are three interlocking metabolisms and in the manuscripts he doesn't talk about metabolism yet but he says this equation that's always so dramatic that i like to say but he says like naturalism equals humanism equals communism And I don't think you can make much sense out of that claim unless you really see that metabolisms, there are three metabolisms that are all held together. And communism is essentially the collective management of those metabolisms. But since we have the swerve and an unpredictability of matter, and we don't know what the metabolisms are going to do in the future, we have to be careful and we have to experiment with some caution, which is to say, not get burdened down with too many ideologies up to including communism itself as an ideology. Like, communism means X. Let's be careful there. It's not up to you. It's up to anybody engaging in communist practice to determine what that means. It's going to change in time. And the more you open it up to the more people, it's going to even look different. There's not a single communism. I think this is one of the reasons why Marx is so hesitant to say much at all about what communism would look like. It's because it's not something that is a theoretical postulate. It's it's an open structure for experimentation. And who knows what that will look like in different geographies and time periods under different contexts and struggles. Communism will look different. And that I think that has to be part of the communist imagination is that it's an open process and it doesn't all have to be the same in its outcomes. And I think what that does is it diversifies culture. If we could have a, a larger diversity of culture and ways of interacting uh, with nature, because communism, again, is also naturalism. But again, not something many communists are going to openly say that communism is naturalism. Uh, but nature in this way is it's communist. It's experimental. It's working. It doesn't mm-hmm. always go well. It can go really badly. So this is also not just like a utopian vision of like communism is always awesome. No, look, communism is not a state that can be awesome or bad. Communism is an ongoing practice of experimenting and trying to get things the way people like them to be. And they're going to argue and they're going to disagree. They might even kill each other and do crazy stuff. But that's part of the process of figuring that out. You can't skip that step and go to the end and be like, let's skip all the war and just declare a total peace as long as we agree on the state and structuralized violence and capital. 
it forecloses the entire project and ends history at that moment. But communism has an open history. And I think that's why, one, I don't say too many overly defining features of communism, because it's important not to and to let, like, let communism reside in the hands of the people who are struggling for it and not in the hands of academics speculating about what it is or, or even what Marx said. And it's actually really nice that he didn't say too much about it because it leaves it a bit more open. All we have is that it's like free association. And that's pretty generic. If everybody's going to participate, well, who's everybody? Did Marx have in mind everybody? Like he couldn't anticipate the new subject formations that would emerge in history. But that's why it has to be open. And we can't be too quick to say everyone, like we know who everyone is already in advance. Mm. Um, anyway, I, I'll, I'll stop there. But essentially communism, it's a management of all those metabolisms, including human and cultural metabolisms. But if you just give up on the process, which you could give up by saying communism equals X. That's giving up on the project. It's like you already know what metabolism is going to do. Ecological history lesson, we don't know what metabolisms are going to do. Every projection for climate change has been off by a long shot. It's always nonlinear and exponentially worse than we think it's going to be because the ecosystem is dramatically out of our control and knowledge. So like, mm. that's a good communist lesson right there is like, let's not get too carried away with exactly what communism would look like and how we would exactly manage nature this is going to have to be a learning process with a steep curve at this point in history. So you, you've at answered least for the West. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's only I was, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you, Adam, because I've just thought of a of, of one thing, which is there's one case where I think Marx does give a definition of communism, and it, I can't believe I didn't make this link earlier in the interview or when I was reading. But they say that communism is the real movement which abolishes the present state of things, which might be vindictive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. He also has my other favorite thing he says about communism in the manuscripts is he calls it the emancipation of the senses. And I think that's an underattended mm -hmm. dimension of communism. You know, people think about social and uh, social things, but like emancipation of the senses, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just as much as an aesthetic project as it is a political project. Those two things can't be pulled apart. There's mm -hmm. always an aesthetic dimension. And Marx was well aware of that. He's like, look, it's not just about emancipating us so that we can like have enough to eat. That'd be great. Yes, you've got to have enough to eat. As Virginia Woolf says, one, can't, one cannot think unless one has dined. One can't act well or read well or do anything unless we've eaten well. And Marx, that's a basic Marxist idea. You've got to have those basic things and then mm -hmm. you emancipate the senses. And that's roughly a, more or less Virginia Woolf's kind of communism as well. The emancipation of the senses is... It's good to reread that, particularly away from the very Feuerbachian reading of senses, where essentially human sensuality is a universal essence, is actually just God, and we just need to appreciate ourselves if we were God. Uh, whereas for Mar yeah, in terms of the notion of sensuality in Marx, I think is quite underrepresented, especially under this kinetic theory where the absence of discretion, of a fixed idea of oneself, because you mentioned as well for Marx as this inner repulsion of matter is also this, this first rep repulsion of itself from itself, is actually the first form of self-consciousness, not to get too panpsychist about, about the whole thing, but in terms of producing a kind of a, a plasticity, so to say, of self-consciousness by freeing matter from its own fixity and by adding a bit more determinacy to it, I think it's also a good point for movements to present them with a, a different view of materialism, rather than the sense of you are this fixed material thing and you need to be this, you need to configure yourself as this thing for the party and then put the proletarian A into bourgeoisie and then we have you know, revolution achieved as if it's a sort of a Lego brick kind of thing. I think sort of revealing sort of the plasticity of materialism here gives, it does free the imagination up a little bit to let oneself swerve a little and to, you know, to no longer sense oneself in the fixed ways that capital provides as a worker and you know, in sort of the bad faith of Sartre. And I think this reading materialism in terms of it also takes it back to the Hegelian roots a little bit in terms of the very presentist view of things. You know, here Herodas, Hicks, Salter, as Marx himself uh, quotes again, here is Rose, dance here, jump here, leap here. But how, however we go with it in terms of presentism. But uh, overall, yeah, so this was a really fun book to read. I think there's a lot more stuff that can be done with. I'd really like to see this being put into a conversation and put with some of the critiques of mechanism you get in the, the German 18, uh, sort of early 1800s, because there's, a lot of shelling, a lot of Hegel here. And I think with people like Zizek, they, they do a lot of shelling and Marx linked together, but they always take it from the later shelling where he's all mystical and all of this. But I think here we have a good basis for a theory of matter that isn't dogmatic, a theory of matter that is not so fixed in itself that the only immovable object I can think of is an old Trotskyist at this point. And I quite like the idea of uh, taking it away from the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, because I think 
more we're seeing it these days as a kind of a tendency of the rate of prophecy to fail, <laughs> both in the Marxist <laughs> side and of the capitalist side, because as soon as one bet goes wrong, like Lehman Brothers, it all fucking collapses. So I think we could definitely <laughs> rephrase things there. But just to summarize, I mean, I just wanted to I'd say thank you again for coming on, Thomas, and thank you for coming on to Convergences. It's been great. Thanks for having me. Everyone, go read Marx in Motion, a new Marxist materialism.